Welcome to Glassroots Virtual Studios. I'm Roger Tucker. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees for Glassroots. Glassroots is a glass art studio in downtown Newark, New Jersey, that works to ignite and build the cultural and economic vitality of our community through glass art. Since you can't visit our studios at this time, each day we're bringing activities to you via Facebook, Instagram, and our website. Please be sure to sign up for our email list to get your full week schedule ahead of time by sending your email to info at glassroots.org and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Today I'll be interviewing the internationally famous artist Willie Cole in the studio. Willie's an American sculptor, printer, and conceptual artist. Cole is best known for assembling and transforming ordinary domestic and used objects into imaginative and powerful works of art. Mining his own African-American heritage, cult Cole creates work that celebrates African art and culture. Willie's work is found in numerous private and public collections and museums around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Newark Museum of Art. So we're, uh, we're ready to go. So welcome, Willie. Welcome to the Glassroots Virtual Studio. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a nice space. I'm glad to be in it. <laughs> Great. So, Willie, the first question to get started. How do you describe your creative process, or as you call it, your creative journey? My creative journey um, on, a, on a daily basis, it's about just play. Mm -hmm. But I often use the metaphors around uh, bodies of water to help me uh, place myself or my situation, whether it be a creative project or a business project or a life project. So, you know, I use terms like, um, like this image that you see here, the black and white text. Um, I think of uh, the lower stage would just be a drip the upper stage would be an ocean and all the bodies in between map our journey from being from the beginning to the ultimate. Hmm. Okay. Great. Great. Of course, so, I can give you so much more detail, but I'm, uh, I'm letting you drive. <laughs> great. Well, I, I appreciate that. So again, again, this idea of process and uh, I know all artists uh, have either a personal or again, something that sort of drives this, this process. So um, my next question is, why do you work with found objects? I work with found objects for many reasons, because the objects find me. And once they find me, they, they talk to me. You know, and uh, I discovered that just by walking down the street in Newark and seeing things on the street that just called, called me in. So I began to work with those things. Uh, at that time, at the transition point of that time, I had been working primarily as a painter and an illustrator. But I was an artist or an aspiring artist uh, with no income. <laughs> and painting canvas costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So these objects on the street, they were saying, look at us, you know, we can, we can do nice things for you. We can reveal many things to you. It won't cost you a dime, just some time. So I put in the time. Great, great. So you work in many types of materials. I, I think most of us, or at least some of the viewers, are familiar with the, um, these found objects and materials. Please tell us the idea behind the cast glass statue that you have there on your, uh, your work table. Yes, I have been very interested, I guess maybe genetically, intellectually, and spiritually in African thought and culture. Mm -hmm. um, I have been drawn to a religion my whole life because, you know, I come from a line of ministers. Oh. So I began to study African religion when I was in college with uh, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries. And that continued on. Uh, and at some point I, I had a good friend with an art dealer who sold African art. Mm -hmm. And that 
kept me in that thought pattern when I would visit his studio or his gallery, I would see these works of art. So, you know, I, I see the Yoruba deities as the forces of nature and I chose to explore each of them in the work for many years. Uh, this piece is, um, I made it at the Pilchuck Glass Blowing School in, uh, in Seattle, in the Pilchuck Mountains. I was there as an arts and resident uh, the summer of 1994. And uh, I learned glass blowing, slumping, solid casting, lamp work, all those different techniques. Um, but, you know, the thing that makes the contemporary art is it's not just a copy of something from the past, but it's a reinterpretation, reinterpretation or reimagining or a combining of uh, symbols from various periods of time and culture. So I picked up on that word African-American uh, many years ago uh, after Jesse declared we were not Afro-Americans, we were African-Americans. <laughs> and so I've started to combine African looking things with American looking things, or I would make American things look like African things. So this is kind of a hybrid or at least a spot along that journey because the figure, I, I made this out of clay initially and uh, it is a a clay, it was a clay copy of a Shango dance wand figure. Uh, I just enlarged it. But the Shango piece would have a big bow or ax on his head. It's really an ax, it looks like a bow though, a lot. But because I, at that time, uh, was what I call Willie the Scorch or the Iron Man, mm. I decided I would replace the headdress with an iron. So that's that's how it came about. Great. I, I love, you know, this idea of contrast. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think of contrast as visual difference. And mm -hmm. the idea of this traditional or ritual piece that many people are familiar with, this uh, African priestess mm -hmm. with an iron on her head immediately is compelling and asks lots of different questions. Uh, again, we talked about these domestic objects uh, that are so important to you and this juxtaposition of the African with the American. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this, the idea of the domestic object, like the iron? Uh, the domestic object, man, these, these questions could have like two hour answers. Okay. <laughs> but they, and people who've heard my public talks have heard these stories before. But I was a collector of information and in that journey, I collected every speech by Malcolm X. Hmm. And the one that, that uh, inspired me in my visual arts was the house Negro and the field Negro. So, you know, so I imagine I did a lot of pieces about this in different materials. But of course, we all know what the house Negro means. We know what the field Negro means. So I imagine that the field Negro at night would become his his uh his authentic self mm -hmm. you know out of the eyes of master just be you know that african whatever he sees himself as before slavery but the house negro has to be more uh covert with his image <laughs> right <laughs> i love that so, and, it, and it is it's very similar this although this is my imaginings it's very similar to the fact that the um, the Africans who were brought to places like Cuba and New Orleans, they had to hide their religion inside of the Catholic religion. So in my imagined story, the Africans are hiding their spirituality in the domestic objects, the house Negroes that are, because wow. they're surrounded by these things, you know, like, in a war, the house Negro would get his iron board as a shield, mm -hmm. you know, and all these objects have, have power. They have power because the users depend on them, you know, and they have contact with our bodies, like the iron touches your clothes, your clothes touch your body. So the iron is powerful. You count on that iron to make you look good. 
So the domestic violence came to me because of the house Negro. Huh. And I said, what would the house Negro's uh, trappings be? You know, it would be his iron, his ironing board. It could be pots and pans. But for me, it became primarily the iron and the ironing board. Even though I've done some washing machines before too, but mm -hmm. mostly iron and ironing board. Wow, that's great. So again, this idea of something that looks innocent, like an like um, iron, could be something that could be containing something that's very powerful to the person who uses it. Yeah, just just like you you go to a museum and you see a like a, a small figure carved out of wood with a hole in it. And that hold of <laughs> stuff with magical ingredients. <laughs> These irons, irons are the same way. You know, uh, steam is a spiritual representation. You know, because it exists uh, in a form other than solid. Yes. So these steam holes, you know, represent that. And in fact, they are the gateways to that spirituality. You know. Uh, symbolically, symbolically, the iron represents so so many things because it has heat. You know, heat is life. You asked me, was it a, a a nice bright day here? So, right. You know, the iron is heat. The heat is the fire. The electricity is the power. We're all electrical beings. You know, electromagnetic beings. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a lot of stuff in there. Great. So was this your first time working with glass? With um, this uh, I think it was, yes. I made about, I made three of these and I did a lot of sandblasting into uh, thicker glass, like maybe that thick. Okay. The image of a, of a steam iron is just the hole patterns. I did a lot of those. They became a big uh, seller in my dealer in New York. Okay, I think that that piece is to combine glass with an image is in the uh, collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Yes, true? yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My wife and I were at one of your talks years ago when you uh, described that piece at the museum. Great. Oh, yeah. And back in those days, I was definitely the Iron Man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, listen, so that leads you to the next question. What projects are you working on now? Uh, I am always doing a lot of things at once. Some things last year, some things last just an hour. Um, so again, like all the questions, it can be a big answer to that one. But the past two days, I've been working to finish pieces that I didn't finish for my New York show last spring. They've just been laying in the studio, you know, since since the summer. So in the past two days, or I'd say this week, I've got two of them at 99%. Okay. So I'll probably finish them today. Is there any, is there a possibility that you could share one of these pieces with us? Yes. Great. Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just grab this one by the throat. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Here. This one's easiest to grab. I don't know how it looks. It's really hard to see. Could just move it a little bit over more? Just away from me a little bit? Great. That's great. I know it looks very small. This is that one percent I haven't finished yet. <laughs> this now I'm gonna bring so it close Willie, to the camera. Okay, if you can move it a little bit more away from you, so you can get back into the to the screen. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, great. I just gotta lift it up so you can see. Oh wow! See that face. Yes, I can oh, see the cool. lips, the texture on the lips. And that face, that's kind of, it's more of a mask. That, that whole face is one shoe. Really? Okay. We but I have the... to, I have to sew it on to that back shoe, which is the head and the hair or the headdress, whatever it might be called. Mm -hmm. And then I got the baby on the back. Oh. See that happy little baby back. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I'm not sure if he's got earmuffs, a hood, or just some eye decorations. Mm -hmm. So I have to decide on that with these things here, what I want to make them flat, Great. keep them as they are. So this was yesterday's work. I actually started this piece in 2013. Wow. And it was wow. unfinished because I could not figure out how to make a head or face out of a single mm -hmm. shoe. Wow. But uh, 
nowadays I've, I've grown. I've gone from being a drip <laughs> to being a river. <laughs> right. So that, again, that creative process you talked about. Yes, I know how to do that now. And I can show you the other one if you like, too. Great. Would you? That'd be great. I just push this one over this way. Okay. They're all fantastic. Wow. Wow. And these, and Ellen from Class Roots just reminded me that these are very similar to the seated piece that you have at the North Museum currently. Um, but now well, you're yeah. just focusing on the head? Yeah, this one is actually, I guess, similar is a kind of interesting word. It's a full body and it's black. Mm -hmm. uh, the Newark Museum piece is uh, started out the same size at Real Shoes, but it was enlarged and cast mm -hmm. in bronze. Fantastic. So I go back and forth between full figures and just heads. But because I'm in the cleanup phase by completing unfinished pieces, it's a different one every day. Wow. I, have, I have about five more to do. Now, now, do you have studio assistants working with you on creating these pieces? I, I got an angel assist. <laughs> an angel assist, okay. So a spiritual. That's about spiritual. it. Okay. That's about it. But because this is my 100% life every day, mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't require a clock. I mean, I can be, uh, and it's the studio, this studio is in my house, so I can uh, make dinner and make art at the same time, you know. Turn on the burner, then come in here and look at something, you know, touch it a little bit, go back, back and forth. Yeah, so yeah. it's just, a, it's like an all day process. Mm -hmm. I, on a daily basis, my, my thing is to just walk from one end of my house to the other and mm -hmm. touch as many things I can along the way. I don't get bogged down staring at one thing for hours at a time. Preferably not. But when it gets close to finish, I find that I, that I'm doing that. Great. Whether I'm hands on or just eyes on, but I have to sit so, and look at things for a long time. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. The uh, next question I have is what's next? What new materials or directions are you thinking about? Uh, I'm not thinking about it. It's not about thinking. It's about being open. You know, once you start thinking, you're, you're kind of building walls because you're trying to find everything. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's more about just being open to energy. So like I will go to my local thrift store, just walk around, maybe something will call me. Or I'll go to uh, Sears appliance aisle, <laughs> walk up down the aisle, <laughs> see if something grabs me, you know. It's, it's really just about being open for inspiration all the time. Now I know, back to the water, I know what river had the great fish in it for me. Mm -hmm. So far in my life. And that's gonna be the thrift store or the appliance aisle. Okay. So I, you know, I walk through there every once in a while, but I'm open to a lot of things. Uh, you know, I'm doing other things as well. I'm, I'm also writing stuff. In the seventies, I used to write children's stories. I had a couple of them published. So I'm kind of doing that now again, uh, illustrating them using a the computer instead of just watercolors like I did in the seventies. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I, I am uh, feeling a strong awareness that life is moment by moment, day by day, because I've lost about five people in this in this virus time. Wow. wow. So it has made me jump out of one of my closets <laughs> and be real more public. So I've been uh, working towards making guitar, a guitar song on Instagram once a week. I thought it was gonna be once a day, but it's turned out to be once a week. Wow. Well, Willie, we had asked uh, people uh, online to submit some questions. Okay. And the first question that I'm going to uh, ask you is something that another artist asked, and it's very, very uh, apropos to what you just said. The, the artist wants to know, how is music and any other recreational activity these days influencing your visual art practice? Has COVID-19 mm -hmm. brought any new insights or perspectives? Yeah, you're right. See, well, COVID-19 has uh, has told me 
to get out and play that guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I've always played the guitar since I was a little kid. I love to sing, but that's not my public persona. But COVID-19 has made me do that live, not live, but do that on Instagram TV. <laughs> Wow, that's um, great. Now, how it's affected my visual artwork, other, other art forms, to me, it's all the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. the, the thing is to be able to access creative energy. Once you do that, you can apply it to anything, whether it be so writing. This trans or, right. You know. So this idea of transference, right? It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like a fluid. Yeah, it is, because it's a living thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I guess that's the answer to that one. <laughs> Thank you. And, and you brought it up before, so that, that was perfect. The next question, do glass objects offer connections with African-American culture and African art? Do glass objects? I would say, I don't, I cannot think of historical use of glass in any West mm -hmm. African art. But I'm sure if you travel east, you'll find some glass. Great. Great. Okay, the next question. What did you know, when did you know that art was your calling? And at what age? Um, well, I started making art when I was three years old. I didn't know what a calling was, <laughs> but I knew what I'd like to do. Okay. And uh, I think by the time I got to high school, I knew that my calling was in the arts, but I went through most of high school wanting to be an, an actor or a director. I see. So. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. The uh, next question, does drawing or sketching inform your 3D process? Not at all. I don't draw or sketch these pieces made from shoes or from irons or from bicycles. I don't, I don't sketch my sculptures out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I say it's all just a project or process that grows out of play. I sit in front of a table with say 12 pairs of shoes and I just play. You know, I say, oh, let's put these two together. It's, it's almost like I have a jigsaw puzzle, but it came in a brown paper bag. There's no picture on the bag, so I don't know what it looks like, but I got all the pieces and I just play with it. Now, I draw the shoe sculptures after they're made. Okay. That way, if I want to make a similar composition, I'll know that this particular thing works. Um, my things out of water bottles, I don't draw those things either, but they do involve more uh, pencil and paper because they're all based on numbers. Sure. For example, uh, I made a 15-foot-long actual size 59 Cadillac, which is 15 feet long but the bottles are eight inches long. So I divide the eight into the 15 feet to know how many bottles mm -hmm. get all the dimensions in every direction. And same with the chandeliers. I know it's gonna be a, a, a cone. It's gonna end up at a point. The bottle is eight inches long. The top is six feet. So I just do the math on all that and you know, make it graduate. So that's Great. kind of a sketch, but it's all numbers. So, so the science of glass, the science of um, using materials to weld things together, the science and, um, and math. Again, these are all the things that we at Glassroots work with our young artists. And it's really great to hear you talk about how you use science and math to make your work. Uh, the last question, uh, what's the found object that you wish you could work on or work with, or you plan to work with? Is there some object that you wish you had worked with or you plan to work with? Uh... No, I, I don't have a object that I, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not a wisher, you know, so I don't have any wish, wish list, especially now in this era of COVID-19. It is, a is, and it is a do, it is not a wish. <laughs> it's not a wish. It's either it's do a, it or just move on. That's right, that's right. And objects, uh, I actually have done a lot of theater and in the next five years, I will make that more part of my my fine art presentation. I see a lot of performance yeah. artists now. Mm -hmm. Some good friends, actually, performance artists, and that kind of interests me. You know, it's a this is strange, strange uh, approach to art making. 
I'm not, and I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm not going to say anything crazy on this broadcast. But um, I saw Melvin Van Peebles on Broadway back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I saw Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death. Right. So much of what was in that play is in the world today as music and performance art. And that was, some, what's that, 30 years ago? That was the 70s. 70s, wow. So yeah. 40 plus years ago. Yeah, I saw that. That was my third play I saw in high school. Wow. So again, this idea of the arts informing the, the, um, per, uh, the performance art, informing the visual art, informing the, um, the arts in general. So the guy, this idea of transformance. And the green grass grow all around and around, and the green grass grow all around. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Well, Willie, uh, we want to thank you and appreciate the time that you spent with us today. And I want to thank our uh, viewing audience for joining us. Remember that Glassroots is glad that we can provide our virtual studios free of charge to our students and the larger community. So if you're able to make a gift to support our ongoing operations, please make a donation online at glassroots.org slash donate. Again, thanks for a great interview. We've been getting fantastic uh, responses and comments. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to know that I'll be talking to you soon again. So, <laughs> again, <laughs> have a good day. And thank uh, you. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Bye -bye. We're going to be Great signing day. off. All right. You too. All right.